Hello and welcome to the Auto Buyer's Guide podcast powered by Alex on Autos. I'm Tim Masso, he's Alex Dykes, and this is a particularly domestic episode of the show. Forgive the background, bless this mess. Let's jump straight into the dialogue because we've got a lot to talk about. First and foremost, General Motors deciding that it's going to be phasing out Android Auto and Google CarPlay, basically. I I stumbled on the Google part because um, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but it's not quite the same thing as phasing out Google. No, which is an interesting, weird twist here. So basically what they're going to be doing is they're going to be focusing on their own homegrown internal applications running on Google Automotive. Uh, the reason for this, they claim, is routing because EV drivers might want EV charge routing. I kind of call BS on that. I think they just don't want to pay the licensing fees for those products. Um, the integrated routing information is of value to people that road trip their EV. If you want to go you know, New York to Los Angeles and you want your EV to automatically take in those dynamic charging stops, guide you, et cetera, that's great. But I would say that 99% of the time, the average driver is probably more interested in interacting with their tunes the way they want to interact with them. Because if I'm just daily commuting, I don't care about the EV charge drive routing because I'm not doing that right now. I want that on that weekend trip away. I don't want it every day. Um, And it's going to make listening to podcasts like this one kind of weird because you'll have to download the app and integrate that in that separate unit. You're not going to get that same that same experience you have on your phone. So if you're looking at your phone and you're listening to your podcast on your phone, listening to your tunes, your tunes, your playlist on your phone, et cetera, and you want that experience to instantly be transported into the vehicle and pick up where you left off, that's not going to be the same thing. Yeah, so let me redeem myself with these tech guys after talking about Google CarPlay. Um, Apple CarPlay (laughs) and Android Auto are going to be phased out primarily because, yes, Google Automotive will be used as the architecture for a new GM proprietary platform, but also because, frankly, if I had to guess, I would say that, A, they can sell data if they're receiving it themselves as opposed to vectoring it towards Apple and Google, and and B, I think this opens the door to monetizing through subscriptions, the degree of functionality in your infotainment system. I think that's really what's behind this. I think they're looking at this as a moneymaker. Oh, absolutely on the subscription front. I mean, they're supposed to be including several years of subscription. There was talk of up to eight years. We'll see what actually happens. Uh, but you, for someone that's going to own it long term, that second owner, et cetera, you're going to need a subscription to do any of the whiz bang things that supposedly the system was designed to do for you. Um, it also is going to be a little bit of a problem in future proofing. One of the weird side benefits of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto is the future proof thing. You know, that came out my car that runs Android Auto, one of the first cars that runs Android Auto or CarPlay. I can have the updated experience with a new phone. I buy a new phone. I keep it on top, the processing improves, et cetera, because all that it is in the car is just a a monitor basically for you. This is not going to do that. So software updates come along. Maybe your car is going to start feeling like a 10 year old Apple iPhone. I I don't know if that's a good thing. Yeah, I guess we'll find out. One thing this clearly resembles is a mirroring of what Rivian and Tesla have been doing, Mm -hmm. albeit with a willingness to bring in an outside tech partner. But I do think that initially they're probably going to offer free Google Maps, Google Assistant, Audible, Spotify access, all the stuff you basically get now. And I would imagine two, three years into this, you're going to start seeing a constriction. Uh, It'll all feel very seamless initially. I think over time it's going to become increasingly subscription based. And we're not going to see it immediately because the first vehicle that will have this is going to be the 2024 a Chevy Blazer, but first GM is going to roll it out over the EVs, where I think maybe people mm-hmm. are already conditioned to expect that they won't have these applications. And then eventually it's going to make its way to the rest of the hybrid and internal combustion field. Do you see yep. Ford and Stellantis ultimately doing the exact same thing or any of the other OEMs? Yeah. I am surprised. I don't I don't think we have seen any indications that the other traditional car companies are planning anything like this. We ha- now have some Ram photos, which we can share with everybody, uh, and they're still going to be supporting Apple CarPlay and Android Autos. No, no intention of them dropping that, it seems. 
Uh, similarly, Hyundai, Kia, Toyota, etc. You know, Toyota finally got on the bandwagon. They were kind of late on that that front, and um, it, it's it is interesting to see how this will be accepted by customers. Are they going to be interested in it? Are they going to care? Is this going to be a competition to who's going to have the Apple Dash or the Google Dash? I don't I don't know. I'm just really concerned about the upgradability and that ever expanding subscription set. On the GM side, they want to wrap in a subscription to everything. They want you to subscribe to the Super Cruise, the the Ultra Cruises, the you know connectivity feature, the Wi-Fi widgets, all that kind of stuff. Um, I would rather have basic CarPlay functionality than the subscription model. Maybe a small subscription for finding your car, that sort of traditional uh, OnStar-like thing. But everything else, I want the data services all on my phone. I don't want multiple contracts around. I just want that one data package, and I want it to follow me. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's almost like a throwback to the late 2000s before these phone-based apps were widely available. When the automakers were looking at infotainment, particularly navigation, as a juicy two to three thousand dollar standalone option in the car, and with mm -hmm. mirroring technologies like CarPlay and Android Auto, it became very easy to buy even a base model and get better functionality than anything the OEM could provide. So it's almost like we're taking that step back to a time when the navigation system was a huge money maker in the car and the customer had no alternative. Yeah, and that could be definitely part of it. So then my last question about this is, does GM have any kind of exclusivity here? Because in theory, they're working through Google. They're using a version of Google Automotive. Others could work with Google unless GM has some sort of agreement, either in perpetuity or for a period. Um, I mean, maybe this is the beginning of automakers needing tech sector partners, mm -hmm. unless Google is just going to franchise this out and everyone who wants it pays a fee and that's it. Well, this is really simply an extension of the same software that we see in the Polestar lineup, in the Volvo lineup, and actually currently in the, the GM products that are on sale today. So it is essentially a re-fiddled re with software version of what we see in the Hummer, the GMC Sierra, the Silverado, the Chevy Trax, all that sort of stuff. Those are already Google automotive systems. So this is just uh, GM's interpretation or their their skin on this system. This is not really a, a Google thing. Google has said publicly Google Automotive supports Android Auto. It supports Apple CarPlay. Um, they're not they're not trying to limit this. Okay, and it's by no means universal that we're going to be seeing a move away from Android Auto or Apple CarPlay because. We always used to think that the tech-based automakers were the ones who were going to phase this out. You can now get it on Lucid. There's a workaround available for Tesla. It's not official, but there is a workaround. Mm -hmm. And Rivian says, supposedly, it's coming. So we'll find out. Uh, this is a big to be continued, and it's a dot, dot, dot. We'll fill in the rest a little bit later as we get more information. Speaking of which, we now have a little bit more information about what the federal EV tax credits are going to look like after April 18th, and that's critical, after tax day this year, the grace period for EVs that do not meet the specs of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, that will expire. And then we're going to see, first of all, critical battery minerals. If you want to get $3,750 starting April 18th, or at least 40% of the critical minerals in the battery must have either been recycled in the US or extracted or processed here. Mm -hmm. And that percentage is gonna to increase to 50 in 2024, 60 the year after, 70 the year after, and 80 in 2027. Now, although battery minerals are components in the physical sense, battery components for the purposes of the Inflation Reduction Act are going to be things with added value, so manufactured components. So to qualify for the remaining $3,750 on April 18th and beyond, you're going to have to have at least 50% of battery components manufactured or assembled in the U.S. or any country that has a free trade agreement with the U.S., which is a big deal because we're concluding one with Japan now, and there's talk that getting around some of the contentious elements of the IRA will also involve a similar agreement with Europe as a whole in the not too distant future. And mm -hmm. until April 18th, 2023, the full $7,500 tax credit is going to be available regardless of battery origins. So this is your window to do this if you're going to do it. You still have to meet the income requirements. The car still has to meet the price requirements, but you've got until then. Finally, blacklisted countries, which include China, North Korea, Russia, Iran. If you have components from those places, once this takes effect, the, the car is not going to qualify. And that's kind of a big deal because it's sort of a kill switch mm -hmm. for entire classes of battery contents. 
But those Chinese, the the countries of special concern, wasn't a this year thing initially. Is it is it going to be phased in early according to these new revelations? No, no, it's it's going to be January first, twenty twenty four. So it's yeah, coming. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, it'll be effective for the next tax period. But yeah. um, you know, to to be continued because whereas there's hardly any. Russian, Iranian, or North Korean content in batteries, there is quite a bit of Chinese mineral content. So we'll see how there this is, works. Yeah. And quite a bit of Chinese mineral processing. So even if the minerals come from Australia, most often they're processed and refined in China, which is a big, big problem. And that's a fact. A lot of the Pacific Rim extraction, including the enormous Australian mining industry, usually does go to Chinese mills before it makes its way to the rest of the world as, as a, a quasi-manufactured, let's call it a processed product, if not a manufactured product. Yeah. There's also talk that Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, might be suing the Treasury regarding these guidelines. So everything here is quasi-provisional pending litigation. We shall see. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how that all sorts out. So we've got a whole bunch of recent drives from Auto Buyer's Guide that we are excited to talk about. And I think the most interesting is going to be the Ram BEV first, because almost nobody has seen it. Alex has. Mm -hmm. And second, because I think there are some misconceptions about what it is, since in rapid succession, we saw the Ram revolution concept. And now we're seeing yes. this quasi production Ram BEV. So tell us, what did you see and what is it? Yes. So uh, lots of confusion here. Ram was showing their concept car and everyone was, oh, the concept car is going to have three rows, it's going to have this thing and that thing. And I was shocked that they bothered to put that out and then went, oh, hey, everybody, here's the production one. And there was generally some disappointment. So let's go ahead and move to the photo stream here so we can see what's going on. Uh, you can see this is the charge door, but we'll scroll through the images. This is the interior, and this is the big thing uh, that we got to see in greater detail. You'll notice that we have the central screen. Whoops, I'm going through these too quickly. you notice we have the central screen that was seen in the Ram pickup truck line for a while, but it's bigger. This is now nearly 15 inches, and it stretches down to basically the trailer brake controller. So zoomed in here, you can see that we have the trailer gain settings on the LCD itself, but the actual trailer brake controller part, that's still a physical knob. Extra screen real estate, there are lots of things going on. But the rest of the dashboard is substantially similar to the rest of the Ram truck lineup, with some notable exceptions. Big LCD instrument cluster, we don't find that in the Ram lineup right now. LCD passenger screen, which we see in the Wagoneer, it's now been adapted to the Ram truck lineup. So you can bet this is going to be a very expensive pickup. Here's the steering wheel, pretty similar to what we've seen uh, out of RAM before, with the exception that we now have drive modes and adjustable regen on that steering wheel. Kind of cool there. So a closer look at that. You can see the drive mode buttons and the regen. We have the uh, rotary shifter that we see in others. But you'll notice we have a mechanical axle lock. So it's actually going to be a mechanical lock on the rear. The seating, very similar to Wagoneer, which is interesting. So if we uh, scroll through some of these other photos, uh, we'll see those switches here at some point. There's uh, some electric screen pages, more shots of the dashboard. Um, moving along here, front seat massage. That's a good thing to see there. Front seat massage, basically borrowed out of the Wagoneer. There's the passenger side screen. Lots of different screens there. Dual wireless chargers. Here are the controls for those seats. So you'll have the adjustable curvature, seat massage, extending thigh cushions, multi-way adjustable headrests, etc. The rear passenger compartment is not left out. This will have a Klipsch audio system in it with surround sound speakers in the front seats for the rear seat passengers. <laughs> and they're calling the very top end trim the tungsten trim. So expect really, really big price tags. Uh, now as to the specs, these are perhaps more interesting. The standard battery pack in the Ram Bev, there are gonna be two, standard is 168 kilowatt hours. It is bigger than the battery pack we find uh, in a wide variety of big, big battery EVs. The optional battery is going to be the largest production EV battery pack ever at 229 kilowatt hours. They're claiming this will give you an EPA range of 500 miles. So they're yeah, they claiming talk. greater efficiency than lightning. They talked a lot of smack about that range rating. Before the, mm -hmm. anyone had seen the vehicle, they were saying 400 to 500 miles. And 
Whereas I'd say the Ram Revolution concept looked more like a clean sheet design like the Silverado EV, what we're getting seems to be a very high spec version of the F-150 Lightning concept where you take a conventional body on frame truck, you install a lot of upscale trim, you install EV running gear, and apparently we're getting a bigger battery than the 212 kilowatt hour Hummer mm -hmm. EV truck. Yeah. So, There's some I mean, interesting twists though here. So, so... On the interesting twist side, it is going to share relatively little, all things considered, uh, with the Ram 1500 directly, although I would assume some of these parts are going to end up on the Ram 1500 right away. Sure. The inside of the bed is likely the same. The Ram boxes are similar, but the sheet metal outside appears to be different. Also, the entire frame is 100% different. Absolutely nothing is shared with the frame on the regular Ram 1500. So it's a lightning style exercise, but actually a bit more complete than what we find in the Lightning itself. The base model, 350 miles of range, top end battery, 500 miles of range. Now it is gonna be fantastically heavy. They did basically admit that it's gonna be a medium duty truck. Uh, it will have straight, it has uh, straight glass on the passenger side, side view mirror. That's usually the indication there. Um, it's going to charge very, very fast. Uh, it's going to support native 800 volts. So it's going to be native 800 volt battery pack, not 400 like we find in the Lightning. And interestingly, not 400 volts like in GM's Ultium platform, because those are an 800 compatible system, not native 800 volts. This is native. 350 kilowatt charging. And by the numbers that they have provided, this is not peak. This is a 350 kilowatt sustained for long periods of time charging window because on the big battery, you'll be able to get 110 miles of range in just 10 minutes, which is a fairly substantial charge. And based on the initial efficiency profiles they've given, that would require that it would have to stay at 350 kilowatts for a full 10 minutes to make that happen. Um, powered front is 15 cubic feet, pretty similar there. We're going to get the same sort of electric offboarding that we find in the competition. It looks like it's around 10 kilowatts of power offboarding, uh, 0 to 4.4 seconds, 650 horsepower. Uh, but then they did the hold by beer to GM and Ford, and it's going to tow 40% more weight than Lightning or Silverado. So 14,000 pounds, maximum payload capability of 2,700 pounds, um, and a real locker on the rear axle. So this is a budget alternative to the Tesla Semi rather than an upscale alternative to an F-150 Lightning. It definitely seems like it. I am now super intrigued to see what the response from Tesla might be because a lot of the claims from Tesla have been, we're going to be the ultimate big truck and we're going to have super payload over, I think they were saying actually about 14, 15,000 pounds as well. Now this is kind of in there, only you're going to have 24-way power massaging memory front seats and all the other stuff that you find in a Grand Wagoneer jammed into the electric pickup truck with a passenger screen, because hey, why not? So it's an F-150 concept in the sense that it uses body on frame, it's a conventionally built truck, but mm -hmm. compromises were made to get the F-150 to market first at the price it was sold at. The one thing I haven't yep. heard about with the Ram BEV is whether there is going to be an affordable fleet-oriented version like there is with the 150 Lightning and the Silverado EV. It seems like they've boxed themselves out of the entry level with all of these techs and specs. There will be a tradesman. Uh, we don't know any details about it, but they have said that there will be five different trim levels. So kind of read into this what you will. Tradesman, Bighorn, Lone Star, Laramie, Limited, and Tungsten. I know that sounds like six, but Bighorn and Lone Star are the same thing. Lone Star sold in Texas, Bighorn sold everywhere else. So five different trims. You can read the tea leaves and see how that aligns with the current uh, Ram lineup as far as feature functionality. Expect Tradesman to be fairly limited but expect it to still be pretty darn expensive. And Lightning is now over $50,000 in its base trim. The hopes of there ever being that $39,000 Silverado, that's out the window. This, that's never going to happen. Yeah, just given the size of the battery you talked about, even the small battery, that's, that's minimally a $20,000 battery. And mm -hmm. I don't see how you can manage to package a sub $40,000 truck around a $20,000 battery. Um, so what are they talking about price price-wise, like from the bottom of the lineup to the top, so it looks like at the top they're going after the Hummers, and at the entry level, I'm not sure they're lining up with Chevy and Ford. Yeah, interestingly, absolutely no talk on pricing whatsoever. Um, I would estimate, though, 
in a realistic world, the base model of Ram 1500 EV is going to be really substantially close to the base model uh, version of the Lightning with the extended range battery pack. So extended range Lightning base model, uh, which is fleet only, you can't actually buy it as a consumer, but that price tag has gone up considerably. It's now going to be about 60 some odd thousand dollars. That's probably where this will start. Is any version, any consumer version of this vehicle going to qualify for the EV tax credit? Because it looks like even basic versions are going to be bumping up against $75,000, $80,000. We don't really know. Most likely, there's going to be some version that will, although they have not also said where the batteries will be built. So that is a little bit of an open-ended question. Slantis has had other commentary on battery factories in the U.S., etc., but we don't know specifically where these batteries will be built or where they're sourced or any of that kind of stuff. But the truck will be built in the U.S., so on that front, uh, some version or another of the truck should qualify. Okay, so from the biggest truck on the road to, or at least the most massive truck on the road, to more accessible and efficient options. Let's say you want to have some fun and you want to do it off-road in a sort of soft road main. The new Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness, it's on its way. What is going to be different about the Wilderness? Because the Crosstrek itself is all new this year. Yep. So the Crosstrek Wilderness is basically the same formula that was seen in Outback and Forester Wilderness applied to their smallest vehicle. So Lots and lots of body cladding, lots and lots of body cladding, and some sort of unusual shapes to the body cladding as well. It's being a little bit more expressive in this edition. Also has a big Subaru logo spelled out on the rear bumper. But spec-wise, it's essentially the 2.5 liter engine from the regular Crosstrek, 182 horsepower, no turbo there, and the same continuously variable transmission we find in the Forester. So uh, more of an aggressive final drive ratio, slightly stronger internals, etc. No locking differential, and interestingly, no skid plates. Actually, no skid plates in any Wilderness model from Subaru anymore, because it appears that their skid plates were built in Russia, and um, you know we're not buying things from Russia anymore. Exactly. So interesting fact about this vehicle, it's probably going to have an extra half inch ground clearance, which is on top of the already unimaginable 8.7 inches you get in a standard mm-hmm. cross track, which I cannot overemphasize is a subcompact five door hatchback. That's Jeep level <laughs> ground clearance. Yep. You can get 9.2 inches of ground clearance. 9.3. We're going to go 9.3. Even better, exceeding expectations already, Subaru. So you're going to get that new 182 horsepower, 2.5 liter engine. There is a 152 horsepower engine in the Crosstrek lineup. This will not be available with it. We're looking at probably about a $3,000 price premium. The cheapest Subaru Crosstrek that gets the 2.5 is about $30,000. That's the sport model. So figure this is going to cost somewhere, it's going to start somewhere between three to $5,000 above a sport. So you're going to get the Geoland tires, you're going to get the 9.3 inches of ground clearance, 17 inch wheels, a dual function X mode, you're going to get a StarTex upholstery, it's going to be very rugged, 180 degree front monitor, and a lot of anodized copper accents inside and out, plus the wilderness badging. These things are weird going down the road. I got to be honest, when you're approaching a super <laughs> station, it's like a cross between a compact car and a Unimog because of the bizarre amount of ground clearance. Now, there's no locking low range, and it's still a CVT underneath, but it should be able to get you just about anywhere you want to go that doesn't involve really deep mud or rocks. So the other details to know here, uh, towing capacity goes up to 3,500 pounds, mainly due to the extra transmission cooling and the more aggressive CVT. And it's going to have a starting price of 31995 So it's priced uh, at the top of the lineup, really, but... The feature content is somewhere between sport and limited, and then you can add on an option package, which is going to push it up to the most expensive version you can get. Uh, the option package is 2270 It gives you the power moonroof, power driver's seat, Harman Kardon audio system, etc. So, uh, you know, 30, this would be basically 35.5 after destination. Okay, so it's important to remember that if you wanted to load up a Subaru Crosstrek, just go crazy a limited is about thirty two thousand like two hundred dollars so this is going to be at the top of the product lineup probably until we find out what the plug-in hybrid is going to cost so that's where it sort of sits in the in the cross trek world now whether you're actually going to be able to find one on a dealer lot i'm not sure this seems like it's going to be an in-demand kind of vehicle 
Um, so to be continued. The only other feature worth mentioning, and I'm not sure what it entails, is that there's going to be some sort of upgraded rear differential. I don't know if that means it's going to have a higher internal locking factor oh. or if it's going to have like, no, nope, no, very simple. Um, yeah, the, the rear differential is identical to, uh, to the uh, Forester Wilderness. So it's basically just a slightly stronger one than we find in the regular Crosstrek. No additional functionality. It's just designed there for the different axle ratios, et cetera. Less likely to break. Fair enough. Okay. Now, if you want something that is, uh, I, I would say, if we call the Crosstrek soft road, then the sort of off-road looking thing type body style known as the modern crossover, that would be something along the lines of the appropriately named Corolla Cross. We've got a little bit more information about the Corolla Cross. Alex, you've recently driven it. Mm -hmm. Who is this for? It, it fits between like the CHR and the RAV4 in the Toyota lineup. Why would you pick it over either the larger RAV4 or the smaller CHR? Uh, the big reason to pick it over the CHR is, of course, going to be all-wheel drive. It's also more cargo practical, so I think it's better looking as well. The That's other good. reason to get it is the fuel economy. Uh, and here, uh, it really appears that Toyota was trying to sandbag a little bit and, you know, have an an interesting reveal because they had been saying, well, we're going to guess it's going to be around 37 miles per gallon. Turns out it's actually EPA rated for 42. And on our drive loop down in San Diego, we averaged 50 miles per gallon, even though we ended up climbing up a 700 foot, uh, you know, hilly drive section back to the hotel, etc. And it was uh, about a 70 mile loop. Uh, I was really quite impressed with the fuel economy. Um, the price tag, uh, it could be a little bit better. Now, which model did you test? Because there are there are hybrids available, and then there are standard petroleum. Did you get 50 miles a gallon in the standard gas-powered vehicle, or was that the hybrid? That's the hybrid. Okay. So now it's important to mention that there are two different power plants here. If you want two-wheel drive or you want all-wheel drive without the hybrid factor, you're going to get a 169-horsepower engine. If you go with a hybrid, more money, but you're also going to get significantly better fuel economy. Remember, the hybrid is only all-wheel drive. So if you're looking at a Corolla Cross with a gasoline engine and all-wheel drive, you're going to get an average of 30 miles per gallon. That's that's EPA combined. If you go with the hybrid, which is only available in all-wheel drive, again, you're going to get an EPA rated roughly 37. So no, no, 42. 42. It is 42. Okay. So that's it's, what I said. Yeah. 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 So, so that, that, that's, that's the thing that we, that, you know, that, that was, that was revealed basically when at the reveal, which is, you know, embargoed as we are filming this, but uh, will be publicly available, you know, for all of you when you are watching this, so uh, is that we now out. know it's, we now I'm know it's priced in. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm just joking. I'm saying I wasn't um, part of that press event. I'm not cool enough. It. So Alex blew me away there. All right, guys. So 42, why would you pick yeah. the standard petrol all-wheel drive? It seems like the payback it's period is going to be cheaper. Be cheaper. Yeah. So the the hybrid is going to start at 20, 27,970. It's going to be 42 miles per gallon EPA rated. And in real world, again, likely higher than that if you're treating it gently. Uh, open highway, 75, et cetera, you're probably going to be still around 40. Uh, but if you're doing country highway driving, et cetera, you can expect some strangely high fuel economy out of the uh, the plug in, or sorry, the hybrid model. It's going to come only in S, SE, and XSE formats. So slightly different nose than the regular model. And the fully loaded version is going to be $31,065 for the XSE. And then there are a few small option packages you can add to it to maybe add about another 2,500 bucks. And I think it's really Im important to note that if you can stretch to buy the hybrid, not only are you going to get a better equipped vehicle, all-wheel drive standard, far better fuel economy, um, but it starts to make more sense because if you go with a higher spec version of the gasoline-powered Corolla Cross, you start bumping up against the price of like an XLE RAV4 very, very quickly. And yeah. I mean, there, there's literally overlap in the price. And at that point, I'm not sure why you wouldn't get the RAV4. It remains to be seen uh, because, of course, the Corolla Cross is a new model. So part of me would be really not surprised if Toyota ended up raising the price of the RAV4 hybrid as a result of that, that proximity there. We don't have any pricing for the 2024 RAV4 hybrid, and its price tag has slowly increased over time. Like, for example, with the if you're not getting a hybrid system, you go with the Corolla Cross right now, the XLE is going to be $28,500. Mm -hmm. 
if just talking about the 2023 rev for the XLEs can be $30,820. So that's mm -hmm. where I see a difficult decision. If you're not going for a hybrid, you really could step up into that rev four and have a vehicle that frankly is probably going to be much more livable with a medium sized family. It's going to be much more marketable on the resale end because it's a rev four and it's the king of the king mm -hmm. of segments in the U.S. as a compact crossover. Um, but I, I do think that the hybrid system is extremely interesting on the Corolla Cross. Is there anything else of note? Because, I mean, obviously with Toyota, you do get two years of included maintenance, but the warranty is kind of a mm -hmm. underwhelming for 2023, th three years, 36,000 miles. Am I missing anything there? Not really. Uh, I, it seems that, that Toyota would like you to think that the hybrid, RAV4 Hybrid SE is the corollary upgrade model from Corolla Cross Hybrid SE. So in that context, it's a $6,000 bump from the one to the other. Uh, but mainly you're just getting it for the improved fuel economy. Uh, real world fuel economy in the RAV4 is right around 40 miles per gallon. Real world fuel economy in this seems to be a decent amount higher than that. And you're not really giving up much performance, which is the other weird twist, because this is just under 200 horsepower versus just over 210 in the RAV4. But the RAV4 is bigger and heavier. Um, so I, I would say it just depends on exactly what you're looking for. Some people really want that smaller, easier to park format. Interior room, uh, RAV4 is roomier. How much roomier? It's not the biggest deal, but the cargo area is a bigger deal. It is bigger. Um, so your mileage will vary. I think if you're looking at a uh, Corolla Cross LE for just over 26,000, one thing that is interesting, not relative to other Toyotas, but relative to other things that might be compared to like a Jeep Compass, uh, you do get adaptive cruise control and lane departure assist, which mm -hmm. seems like a worthwhile set of safety features. So, you know, sometimes there are details beyond the headline pricing, performance numbers, uh, option packages. Sometimes what you get standard is, is pretty compelling. And I think the best case for a Corolla Cross is to go straight for the most accessible hybrid, which is going to be about $30,000, or just stick with a very entry level L or LE and then get a couple of nice options. Otherwise, you start bumping up against bigger vehicles with overlapping prices. Yep. Now, Prius, Prius Prime. This is interesting because we've got the first exciting Prius since arguably the first Prius. That one was yeah, who'd have thought? <laughs> okay, so the Prime, more range, better looks, yes. higher performance. Where do we start? Yes. Uh, all very unexpected in a, a, you know, a weird sort of way. At least I didn't expect them. Uh, the Prius Prime is now going to be one of the most efficient vehicles you can buy in North America. Uh, we do have all of the details, which, of course, you know, Toyota likes to keep uh, a little close to their vest uh, lately. So 44 miles of all electric range. That's more than anybody had anticipated before. 52 miles per gallon in hybrid mode. So not too much of a reduction versus the regular model and over 120 MPGE. So this is going to be one of the most efficient vehicles when operating on electricity. Uh, it is as fast as a Civic SI, really, and you might be able to get an SI a little bit faster if you really roast your clutch, but this is going to be faster in the stoplight races every single time, uh, which is also a weird twist for a Prius. And it's important to note that these are big gains. The previous vehicle had a rated electric range of 25 miles. Uh, consensus before we had details was that Toyota was going to find somewhere between 10 and 12 extra miles of all electric range. Mm -hmm. They've blown right past that. Uh, also important to remember is that this new Prius Prime has 99 horsepower more than the old one, which in a vehicle this size and this weight is going to be transformative. So we've got 220 horsepower, which is the total system power. And it, like Alex said, there was a generation ago when this would have been considered hot hatch performance levels. Like it would have been comparable to an SI or a GTI mm -hmm. or something along those lines. Yeah, it's, uh, I was really quite shocked that they decided to go in this direction because uh, it, it really wasn't anticipated by too many outside some very select, you know, insider people. Yeah, a quick question about pricing, because there's not a whole lot of different levels of trim, SE, XSE, and XSE Premium. Uh, obviously, you can get a bigger infotainment screen if you go to a higher trim level. If you go with an XSE Premium, you get kind of a, 
you know, G whiz value solar roof that will actually charge the traction battery, which is different from uh, mm. two generations back when the Prius had yep. a solar roof, but it did not charge the traction battery. Uh, yep. What is the sweet spot here, given that there are so few trim levels and the pricing from cheapest to highest is probably what, a $6,000 spread? Yeah, so the least expensive is going to be the SE, and that's going to be $32,350. The most expensive is XSE at $39,170. And, of course, there's destination and then the limited number of options that are available on those. Um, it's really going to – you're never going to get a payback versus the regular hybrid. You're going to have to want the plug-in. You're going to have to want that gasoline mitigation uh, because it's not going to qualify for any sort of federal tax credit. It is made, of course, in Japan. Um, but – I could see, uh, because of this level of performance, I could see it attracting an entirely different kind of shopper. You're going to be slower in a in a Elantra, <laughs> Elantra N line. Uh, Elantra N might be faster if you really want to roast the clutch or you get the DCT, but a regular Elantra N line or a Civic Si or any of that mid-level performance compact thing is going to be slower than a Prius, which is bonkers. And I think it actually looks good. And remember, most of the new Integras coming out are going to be powered by a CV, or at least they're going to be served by a CVT, which is not a very sporting option. So unless you're yeah. looking to go with a manual transmission Integra, the Toyota Prius Prime might mm -hmm. wind up being a better a compact five-door hatch performance play than the Integra. Yeah, which is, again, going to be slower in pretty much all of its forms versus a Prius. <laughs> For now you can see Alex and I are on somewhat uh, a different eye level here because he's coming back from a bunch of factory drives and he's got spec sheets to match. Uh, what I do want to ask, since we've got this Prius Prime now, is whether there are any must-haves here. Do you just go out and buy the standard model and be happy with it? Or was there any upcharge um, package or option or standout feature that you've just got to have? Anything mm. that wasn't available previously that would really make this at the purchase level? It's all mostly an incremental thing. So, you know, is the latest version of Toyota Safety Sense. Um, it you, you can get the solar roof in the upper end trims, etc. Um, I I probably would get the solar roof um, on the Prius mainly because it is very efficient, and solar roofs in before on less efficient vehicles didn't really make a lot of sense, but. The Prius Prime is efficient enough that just in about 14 days of solid sun exposure, eight hours a day-ish, you can charge the battery completely. So you could roll to the airport empty, go on a business trip, come back 10, 15 days later, and expect more or less a nearly complete charge of the battery, which is interesting, kind of cool. The downside to that, obviously, is your car has to be in the sun. Yeah, a couple of interesting features now. If you've seen Priuses before, it's not just the performance that's interesting here. Uh, that's definitely new. It's also interesting that there will be more cargo space because the battery now moves underneath the seat. Mm -hmm. So that's a change. And yep. it, is it does lose a little versus the regular Prius, and it does lose the spare tire, which I'm sad about. But other than that, it's very, very similar. It's a very minor difference between it and the regular Prius. And it's a more conventional cabin, too. You've got your gauges right in front of you, not centrally mounted like on previous Priuses. Yeah, although there is still the weird twist where it's above the steering wheel, like in the Busy Forks. Yeah. So uh, if you're not a fan of that slightly funky look, then you might not like the Prius. But I think it is a bit more conventional, even with that position, than we find in the Toyota EV. It's a little bit less controversial there. Okay, now Subaru Impreza, uh, the question, who is this vehicle for? Because it seems like this version has dialed out all of the sporting and outlaw cred that the Impreza used to have back in the 90s and the 2000s. Ah, uh, yeah, it's for people that are imprezed with the Subaru logo. Uh, <laughs> no, it's basically for that person that wants something all-wheel all drive. It's going to be the least expensive all-wheel drive vehicle in North America. Someone that wants all-wheel drive, they want more of the street look, they want the body color panels. It's basically for someone that's looking at a Crosstrek, and they don't want the body cladding, I would guess. It has sold fairly well, and I would say, even though Subaru has said there's no, there's no sedan version of Impreza, there really is. I mean, there is a sedan version, there is a version with a the manual, there is a version with a the turbo, it's called a WRX. 
In this generation, they split the development of the hatch and the sedan apart. And because the sedan sold so poorly in the Impreza lineup, bearing in mind that Impreza and Crosstrek are literally the same body. So especially when you take a look at that sales figure, we have over 200,000 Crosstreks, however many thousands of Imprezas they sell, 300,000 plus things, you know. Uh, and the sedan version of the Impreza was like, I don't know, 2% of that whole picture. So it just didn't make sense to do that as as a model on its own. And then they realized that of those people that were buying that thing, a lot of people wanted the WRX. So WRX became its own thing, even though it really is an Impreza stand, let's be honest. And now we have Impreza hatch only and cross track. Yeah, so the thing about the Impreza is it has a very low entry price. That to get into an Impreza, in theory, the base price is under $21,000. So now when you look at the Honda Civic, which starts at twenty four five, the Mazda 3 at twenty three six, or the Hyundai Elantra, which starts at twenty two, if you go for the most basic version of the Impreza, which does include all-wheel drive standard, and I believe a 152-horsepower engine thereabouts, um, mm -hmm. it's a very basic. Speedy. No, it will get you through the snow. It does have a manual transmission option, but... No, oh, nope. no manual's way. dead. It's dead? Okay, then manual's forget dead. it. Forget it. Yep. Manual manual's dead. Uh, yeah, manual's dead. CVT is standard and uh, high fuel economy. So the fuel economy is competitive or better than the competition. Also, fairly low destination charge and the two-screen LCD system is standard. So it the plastics on the dash feel a little bit basic, bearing in mind that it is a fairly low sticker price. But weirdly enough, you get more screen real estate than is even available in a Honda Civic. Now, I could say if you divorce yourself from the spec sheets for a minute, which is difficult to do when comparing cars in theory, I've always found that the Impreza has a really nice ride and handling balance, that it, mm -hmm. it almost drives a size larger than it is. Um, and especially compared to something like a Corolla or a Mazda 3, it does feel like a more substantial vehicle. It feels less abrupt right. with bumps. It's mm -hmm. got a nice resistance to leaning in turns. That was always the appeal of the vehicle to me. And that's not something you can quantify, but did you find that? Yeah. It definitely has a, a, a little bit of body roll. I mean, it has more body roll, I would say, than Mazda 3. But its it, suspension, I think, is, is better polished than Mazda 3. Mazda 3's move to a non-independent rear suspension has really hurt it, especially on the roads that normal people drive on. If you're on a track and it's perfect, it's lovely. Um, if you're on a regular poorly paved road surface, the Mazda 3's rear end becomes unsettled easily. The Impreza's doesn't. There's no torque steer uh, in, in this system. Uh, there's not enough power really to torque steer anything, let's be honest. But in the 182 horsepower model, still no torque steer. It still has that kind of vehicle where it's not going to be overtly fast, but you can floor it around anywhere. It's just fine. And the ongoing split in the model line is still there. You can still get this as a hatch or a sedan. Am I... My wild no, Impreza, Impreza is hatch only. Now hatch only. All right. So I guess yep, they still yep. made the choice for you. Um, ultimately, what's what's competitive with this? What what would even be? Obviously, we've got those vehicles I've mentioned, but it seems like the only real competitor for it would be some more expensive Subaru. To be honest, if you want all wheel drive, yeah. under twenty. Yeah, if you want all wheel drive, it's basically a more expensive Subaru or something like a, a compact crossover, a subcompact crossover. So. Uh, Mazda CX-30 is the second most expensive vehicle with all-wheel drive in the U.S. Now, some folks might say, hang on a minute, isn't it less? Uh, MSRP is $5 lower on the 2023 CX-30. 2024 pricing isn't out yet, but the uh, destination charge is $200 higher. So CX-30 is about $200 more expensive than the Impreza. But solid competition, really. When you take a look at the average subcompact crossover like a Kona, uh, things like that, they have about as much ground clearance as the Impreza does. So they're really in the same sort of ballpark. Yeah, you have to consider this to be a competitor to a lot of subcompact and compact trucklets rather than cars, because mm -hmm. there are fewer and fewer cars every year. We have a fascinating truck. It's not a trucklet, and I'm not even sure it's a truck by the traditional standard, but the Mazda CX-90 represents Mazda's move back into larger three-row SUVs, and they give you, I think, six, seven, and eight configurations. Alex, you've just come from 
a, a driving experience with the CX-90 yes. line. What were your impressions? Let's, let's go from the bottom of the line up to the top. How does it stack up? Yeah, rather unfortunately, they didn't let us drive an absolute base version, which I was really intrigued to see. So we got to drive the higher horsepower turbo model and the plug-in hybrid. Glad we got to drive the plug-in hybrid. Um, probably the first and most important thing to know about the CX-90 is that if you shopped for a CX-9 and you thought it wasn't big enough, this is not going to fix that. Uh, because on the inside, it is almost exactly the same size as the CX-9. About the size of a Honda Pilot inside, size of a Grand Cherokee L on the outside, which is not logical, actually, because the design of the structure of the vehicle is very much like the Grand Cherokee L. It's a rear-wheel drive-based vehicle with a very long, longitudinal engine up front. Um, and that's why inside, it's almost identical to Grand Cherokee L as well. So yeah, save that for the, the end of that statement here. Grand Cherokee L, also pilot-sized inside. Um, very important thing to keep in mind. Does a tiny bit bigger than Highlander, smaller inside than Grand Highlander for sure. Uh, the second thing to know is that it really has this focus on driving dynamics. I would also argue that that was the same for the CX-9. So this is just taking that to the next level. So rear-wheel drive biased, brand new rear-wheel drive uh, biased all-wheel drive system there, inline six engine or the four-cylinder with the plug-in hybrid. Supposedly an in-house designed eight-speed automatic transmission. Mazda is very, very proud of this. Uh, they were very offended when I asked if they had been buying or licensing the internals from anybody. We'll probably find out details later if any of that is licensed from ISIN or the like. Um, but they were after a very small, very slim transmission tunnel, which is why it has a very controversial design feature. No torque converter in any model. So even the regular models are going to be hybrids. And the reason they're hybrids is because they sandwiched an electric motor in there between the engine and the transmission and a clutch pack that allowed them to slim down the transmission tunnel, improve the fuel economy slightly with a one third kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack. And when you start off from a stop, the only thing that can move the vehicle forward is the electric motor. It's, uh, it's a fairly healthy, about 111 pound foot of torque electric motor around 11 or 12 horsepower, something like that. That gets you moving. Then they can close the clutch. Then the engine can power the vehicle forward. So you do get this moment of um, lower acceleration. Your initial off throttle off the stop is not the shoviest, shall we say then you get all 340 horsepower in the turbocharged model. The plug-in hybrid is actually a little bit better off the line because it has a much bigger electric motor. So you get more shove off the line, then it can close up that clutch pack and then add even more from the naturally aspirated four-cylinder engine. So those are the important key things to know. Driving dynamics-wise, absolutely fantastic. Uh, solid rear-wheel drive dynamics. The suspension is not the firmest in the segment, but it's certainly a little firmer than average. I think it does really well in the corners. It's very planted, very grounded. The rear suspension, just fine. Lovely, lovely tuning there. Doesn't feel heavy in the rear at all. Um, it is not as speedy as you might think. It, most versions are going to be between about 6.2 to 6.5 seconds, 0 to 60. So it's not going to blow anybody's hat off. Um, the Grand Cherokee is likely going to be faster when it gets its inline six engine under the hood that we all know is coming because it's going to be uh, up there at 500 horsepower, like we see in the Grand Wagoneer. Um, definitely not speed-wise a direct competitor to an X5 or X7, but strangely enough, it, it's, uh, it's an awful lot of X7 going on in this design and packaging and size generally inside and outside. Well, I think it's a, it flatters Mazda that when I posted pictures of the new Ferrari Pura Sangue on my Facebook group page, people said it looks like a Mazda. So I think this is a good looking vehicle. It's got a long dash to axle ratio. We talked last time about how uh, some compromises are inherent in that native rear wheel drive layout with the long dash to mm -hmm. axle styling because you've got a 122 inch wheelbase. And despite the huge gap between this and a Grand Highlander, the Grand Highlander winds up with a lot more interior space because of the natively front-engined configuration. So what yep. you're saying is that whether you go for the 280 horsepower standard six, the 340 horsepower higher end turbo, or and there is a hybrid between them with 323 horsepower, yep. does it pay off regardless of which model you go for? Does each one feel sporty for its price and class? I mean, unfortunately, we weren't able to drive the 280 horsepower model, so keep that in mind. Uh, but it's likely going to be performance-wise, uh, maybe maybe high sixes, zero to 60, so it should be faster than average for this segment still. All of them are going to get 25 miles per gallon, which is an interesting twist. Regular engine, higher horsepower turbo, and the plug-in hybrid, all 25 miles per gallon combined. 
The hybrid model is going to get about 26 miles of all electric range, which is not fantastic, fantastic, but I mean, there's nothing else that seats eight and has a plug, let alone eight seats, a plug and a spare tire, which is an interesting twist. Um, right now, Lincoln Aviator plug-in hybrid is the only other plug-in hybrid I can think of that has three rows and a spare. Uh, very, very unusual for those combinations of things to happen. So I could see a decent number of people that maybe have some traditional values, concerns about a spare. They want that eighth seat, etc. Maybe they could be swayed by this plug-in hybrid model. It is smoother than the regular turbocharged model. Some of the shifts because of the lack of torque converter are unusual, let's just say. Uh, stop and go traffic, slow and go traffic. It is definitely very dual clutch transmission feeling. So imagine first generation Audi DCTs has that same sort of feel. Also, if you're driving it harder, when you lift off the throttle, the clutch pack's still close. So you get that instant deceleration like you get in a dual clutch transmission vehicle because you all of a sudden get all that engine braking. Then it will release the clutch and then you get more of a freewheeling feel and a little bit of regen on the motor. So there are some unusual feelings here. I'm pretty sure that shoppers will get used to it and it won't be a problem, but it will turn off some shoppers that are just sitting in there, have a, a quick uh, quick look and then that's it. Yeah, it's a it's a wet multi-plate clutch, a lot like what you'd find in a lot of AMG transmissions. And I was wondering how that was going to play in a luxury vehicle that's not an all-out performance car. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you can sense a little bit of abruptness. This is not a, yeah. a this is not a dual clutch where you have one gear engaging while the other is disengaging. Those can be made fairly seamless today. But like you said, mm -hmm. the early ones, like the Audi TT 3.2 from the early 2000s, you could feel a notch in every shift. It was abrupt in a way a torque converter is not. Did they explain why they made that decision? Was it solely about packaging the electric motor? I call BS on the packaging thing. They said they wanted a slimmer transmission with a, without the, the bell housing for a, uh, a, a torque converter. Torque converters can be made very slim. There is a way to do that, uh, to have a, you know, a, a, a unique torque converter design and a very aggressive lockup clutch. That would have been possible. Um, I think it was mainly just the efficiency benefit of not having a torque converter because there is a reasonable amount of loss, pumping loss, in a torque converter design that they have now escaped. Also, the plug-in hybrid system uh, is easier to integrate in this design because it's exactly the same. They just stick a bigger electric motor in there, so it simplified and streamlined some of this build process. Also, logically, a slight fuel economy bump in the base model as a result of this. Much better start-stop system, things like that. Uh, it's worth noting that unlike the MCT transmission we find from Mercedes, which is an automatic without a torque converter, this has the electric motor on it, so it feels much better than that. And it feels very much like the Jeep 4xE systems, things like that, the Land Rover and Range Rover plug-in hybrid systems operate this same exact way. So there is some logic to their decision to do this. Um, I am a little intrigued that they are putting so much into hybrid systems and plug-in hybrid systems, but then also designed a brand new inline six engine for the vehicle where they, they could have jammed a turbo under there. That is an interesting twist, I would say. Um, and it makes me wonder if there could be some higher horsepower plug-in hybrid system coming. They wouldn't talk about the total torque capacity for this automatic transmission. And that is one issue with designing their own eight speed if they did indeed do that is that uh say if you're stellantis and you license a zf eight speed automatic the basic structure and mounting points for this zf eight speed are common across the line and today you want a 300 horsepower thing and tomorrow you want a 500 horsepower thing you just go back to zf and you say i would like an 8 hp 75 instead of the 8 hp 45 the lower power version i want the higher one and you stick that under the hood and everything just goes right up to it all the software is very commonly designed etc mazda doesn't have that benefit with this design but they wouldn't talk about all of the details so there might be something coming in the future we don't know i would be intrigued to see if there's a mazda speed cx90 i know that's probably too much to hope for but this general system layout lends itself to higher horsepower figures much better than what they've had before so getting where you're going at the current speeds available, uh, I always thought that Mazda CX crossovers felt like they were one price class above in terms of interior trim, materials, fit, finish, and design. Given how much of this vehicle is located ahead of the firewall, the cabin that you get needs to be that much more special. Did this feel mm. like a flagship? 
I would say it feels like a Mazda flagship. Um, I don't find CX-9 overly premium or CX-5 overly premium for the segment, I would say. CX-30 is solid for the small crossover segment. CX-50 is a modest improvement over CX-5. This is definitely taking Mazda to a new place. But I would say it's important to remember that that new place is not BMW, Mercedes, or Volvo. That new place is Acura in the top trims. But Acura even there with asterisks. So top end trim that we were driving, for instance, um, if you've seen the gorgeous pictures of the interior with the real maple trim and the really eccentric stitching on the dashboard, etc., that is one trim level in the top end trim. Okay. Just that light color. If you get the darker interior color, it's more of a baseball glove brown, then you get some imitation suede things on the seats, suede panels, suede panels on the dashboard, but you give up the wood trim. So there's there's trades there because uh, they really wanted to keep, I think, the pricing under control and maybe the options list. Um, oh, the passenger seat does not have adjustable lumbar. The driver's seat lumbar is only two-way. And you give up some of the other features that you'll find in top-level Acuras. So no massaging seats, which finally have occurred on Acuras. No four-way lumbar no passenger seat with the same range of motion as the driver's seat. Little things like that here uh, get lost in the CX-90. Um, it's also lost the second row seats that allow you to tilt and slide with a child seat attached. So families might find some issue with that. Um, the interior is well laid out, but because of the, the drivetrain design in this, there is a noticeable driveline hump even in the second row. So between the second row seats, there is a about a five inch hump there and so the middle passenger, if you get the eight seat version, is definitely going to have their feet on that little hump. Uh, so there are a few things to keep in mind. Also, less storage space up front because that transmission tunnel is still fairly large. Now, speaking of capacities, the vehicle can tow either 3,500 or 5,000 pounds, mm -hmm. but not every trim level is available with the 5,000 pound capacity. If you want to option this thing for towing, you've got fewer choices. That's true. Um, and Mazda said that the average entry in this, average shopper in this segment uh, tends not to tow very much. And in their market research, they claimed that people that do tend to tow tend to gravitate towards the higher trim levels because they've already, they have more money because they've already spent the money on the thing that they want to tow. So therefore, they're willing to spend more money on the thing that tows that thing. Um, we were not able to test towing, unfortunately, at the launch event. It's something I'm really intrigued to test because we don't have a torque converter. And especially in steeper situations, the torque converter is absolutely essential for towing. If you're going up a steep hill, that initial starting moment, in these vehicles, you are relying exclusively on that electric motor. So going up a steep hill in the regular turbo version, you're depending on a 111 approximately horse, sorry, just, over, just under 120 pound foot of torque electric motor, about 11 horsepower to get you up that hill. That's not a lot of oomph until it can close that multi-plate clutch and get the engine involved. In the plug-in hybrid system, you get a little bit more, but because the plug-in hybrid system doesn't have as powerful of an engine, the towing capacity is actually lower than on uh, the turbocharged model. So I'm really intrigued to see what that actually feels like. And when can we start to see these available in dealers, or at least when is, when is delivery theoretically scheduled? Uh, these should be on dealer lots right around the time that we're, you're watching this video. So sales are commencing right about now. Uh, the plug-in hybrid system is going to come a little bit later. And uh, if you want one of those, you probably need to get on the list because it looks like Mazda has, has uh, under, under anticipated the amount of demand for the plug-in hybrid system. All right. And Alex, where can people find us on the internet? All of your favorite unusual places. If you're watching the video version of this, be sure and check out the podcast for your drive home. If you're driving home, be sure and check out the video so you can see all of those pictures of the Ram Bev at the beginning. Find us over Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those other places. There'll be links on the screen uh, or in the description of this podcast. And we'll see all of you next week. <laughs> I'm Tim underscore Masa on Instagram. You can find me there. Toodaloo. Right, bye, everybody. Bye.